Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. Uh, my name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Timothy Conway. Do you prefer to be called Timothy or Tim, or doesn't it matter? I like Timothy. Timothy, okay, we'll stick with Timothy. And um, Timothy and I somehow connected, I don't know, a few years ago. I, I think maybe I saw something you were posting in an AMA chat group or something, and I contacted you about something, and then we kind of ended up on each other's humor and political lists, and uh, which is actually not the only spiritual person I've interviewed who's ended up on my political list. There's another the guy I did a week or so ago and was in the same predicament. And uh, so, uh, you know, I've kind of known him from that angle, um, but it was actually only in, until recently that I read things he had written or things about him in uh, greater detail, um, specifically uh, an interview in Non-Duality Magazine, to which I'll link from batgap.com, and also a, a very interesting page. If you do a search for Neo Advaita in Google, this page comes up in the number one position. It's a, about a 44-page thing that Tim wrote and assembled uh, about Neo Advaita or, or Pseudo Advaita or whatever you want to call it versus Real Advaita or Non-Duality. And maybe we'll touch on that topic a little bit as we go along. But in any case, um, thank you for um, arranging to do this, Tim, uh, Timothy. I don't have, to get, have to get used to that. And uh, I, I'm really, I've really been looking forward to it. Me too. It's been uh, this fun cyberspace solidarity going on between the two of us, uh, <laughs> as with so many dear souls. What powerful technology that somehow some universal mind uh, or minds is uh, congealing where we can, uh, again, have great resonance on, on spiritual topics and realizations and aesthetic beauty and you know, all the gorgeous photos people are sharing on the net and, and the cute animal photos. You can get tired of that, seeing <laughs> the, the suchness of each being, each manifestation of the one supreme self uh, and these mm. beautiful animals and, mm. and then again the, the humor which keeps us all light as some may know I have this huge spiritual humor collection at our enlightenedspirituality.org website and then of course the political, social justice uh, racial justice economic justice issues who can be a mystic and that you know, feel everyone's pain is my pain and Everyone struggling is my struggling, the solidarity with all life. So uh, Rick is an incredible source. Thank you, Rick, for uh, just all that you do. I, I kind of wonder, uh, you know, do you have a parallel life where you're generating and passing along all this stuff? Because uh, I have no one on my list who is sharing as much as thyself. So <laughs> boundless Boundless gratitude. Not that, mind you, I have the time to read all of it or even see all those cute animal photos, but I actually save probably two-thirds of the stuff you send along for some, I guess, parallel life for me where I'll get a chance to fully enjoy all of it, not just some of it. <laughs> if you ever get sick or something, you can just sit there and look at animal photos for a week or two. <laughs> right. No, that would be healing. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. What was I going to say? Well, let's just uh, let's just start um, by, yeah. about your story. Uh, you know, it, it took a little bit of uh, arm twisting for me to get Tim to uh, you know want to talk about his personal story because he really identifies quite strongly with um, you know the sort of the impersonal, universal quality uh, or, or aspect of reality. But he does have a very fascinating story on a, on a personal level. And as I'm sure we'll uh, allude to a number of times during this discussion, um, Tim sort of shares my perspective that the, the personal is not to be dismissed or ignored as insignificant as some people seem to tend to do when they uh, initially identify with the impersonal. They kind of brush off the other half of life. <clears throat> so um, let's... Uh, Let's consider how you arrived at that perspective, Tim. I, uh, the first uh, thing that kind of struck me in your non-duality magazine interview was an experience you had when you were about 16 years old or something like that. Yeah. Uh, what to say? I mean, I went into great depth there. John LeCay, the interviewer, really got me to share more about this than I, I'd ever done. So all the details are there. He wanted to know what I felt, what I saw, and specifically what happened and uh -huh. what led to it. And, uh, 
So I've gone into all of that. Basically, you know, I'll give the gist here because there are a lot of delightful topics to talk about. And whereas I'm really interested in the personal, it's not my person. I'm interested in fellow beings. And uh, by the way, I would I always like to distinguish for you know, satsangs and classes and dear friends who gather at uh, guest lectures and stuff that I'm invited to share that uh, the realization of the absolute is not impersonal. You know, hydrogen gas and rocks and minerals are impersonal. We persons are so much more than, again, like hydrogen gas clouds or something because we have expressivity, sensitivity, uh, creativity, so forth, the capacity for inter relational empathy. Uh, maybe the hydrogen clouds have that too, but we can't detect it. So I distinguish between the impersonal and then the personal, which is so much more, it seems anyway to us, than the impersonal. But then beyond that, whatever we wish to call the great supreme spiritual reality that's our source, that's dreaming all of us moment by miraculous passing moment, this absolute reality must surely be supra personal or transpersonal to say Abraham Maslow and the transpersonal psychology crowd has been calling it since 1969. So somehow this supra personal reality which dreams all of us beautiful, poignant, sometimes kind of pathetic, <laughs> ridiculous persons. I was such a one. I was a kid, a jock. A religion was my uh, my religion growing up was Catholicism, but it was just nominal. I have to say bye to some of those carrying car plants. Thank you, Yannicka. Bye bye. And uh, uh, sports was my real religion as a kid growing up. So at about age 14, a series of knee injuries, uh, playing football, basketball, and so forth, just started wiping out any possibility of an athletic career. And that had always been my. You know, my dream as a, as a boy when adults would ask me, what are you going to do, Sonny, when you grow up? I always thought I would somehow be involved in sports, a career in it as a performer and then maybe a sportscaster or sports writer or something. So and that's all I was reading as a kid was Sports Illustrated and books about athletes, fictional, non-fictional works. And uh, I suddenly realized all of this is just being taken away with these knee injuries. So I was in a depression. A situational depression, quite clear. I look back and you know, my dreams were very dark, filled with strange entities, strange happenings. Uh, it was hard to just get up in the morning. I just felt like, is there a way I can just you know, pull a switch and make all of this disappear? So uh, more and more I was getting more morose, more down, more devitalized. I wound up coming up uh, down with step throat. And that strep throat had me sidelined for about a good two weeks. I remember being on antibiotics and seeing the doctors a lot. And uh, they said, you're just going to have to take a long time off of school and wait it out because uh, you also don't want to infect others. So I said at home, and those two weeks or so at home were just like some kind of hell. And interestingly, our Jesuit uh, priests and novices and the lay teachers at my high school, I went to a Jesuit prep school high school in Los Angeles, uh, they uh, <clears throat> they had us reading the French existentialist, so <laughs> that's not a good combination for teenage kids. It's like uh, running, rubbing for, salt in your wounds. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, young people it's hard enough growing up with just with the hormones and in our Western culture. I won't go into a long thing about that, but it's very easy for teens in our culture and older folks to be in real identity crisis. Who are we really? What are we here for? What's our our Swadharma, as they would call it in India, our, our vocation, as the Catholic tradition called it. So I hadn't awakened any of that. I felt completely lost. I felt like I was disintegrating and just, uh, again, getting so devitalized and depressed. And all of that um, French existential literature with the emphasis on the absurd and the meaningless was, uh, you know, maybe the, the final straw. So... I began to definitely start in my mind wondering what would be the cleanest way that would leave the smallest mess to exit this life. In other words, I was becoming suicidal. And then finally, I was well enough from the strep throat not to have any more excuses not to go to school. So 
I started going back to school, but it came even worse at that point because now interacting with fellow human beings and seeing people like at the market or you know, in the cars next to me on the freeway, it seemed like everyone was stuck in this sense of hopelessness and, and uh, emptiness of life. And uh, I actually began to ask people, if, you know, are you happy? And I couldn't find anyone who didn't have some kind of qualification or excuse for not being happy. One day in the afternoon, I realized my body had gotten very devitalized. I needed some exercise and get my energy going again. Again, I'd been so active as a kid. Uh, you know, I was trying to play sports my entire life, basically, whatever chance I could get to be outside throwing a ball or shooting hoops or whatever. So uh, I went out in the backyard. My parents at that point lived up near Mulholland Drive, looking out over the San Fernando Valley to the north. And uh, I was out there doing some calisthenics. After about 10 minutes, I felt the urge to just stand there, and I was suddenly just riveted. And whatever was going on, I hadn't prepared for this in any way, hadn't read any spiritual books or anything. Uh, the only thing, and I forgot to mention this in the Non-Duality Magazine uh, article, the interview with myself, was I had been contemplating what is this void of pure God before God creates a cosmos, hmm. before there's a universe, what is there? But that, you know, wasn't in the foreground of my consciousness that afternoon when I was doing the calisthenics, but it must have been somewhere in the background. It allowed a kind of an openness. And suddenly everything just dropped away. There was this profound opening. It was as if you took Timothy, this you know, depressed, confused, spiritually stunted kid, and you just replaced him with nothing but love and joy and gratitude and the sense of vitality. And, um, I felt like in a kind of subtle, subtle vision. I'm not a visionary, uh, although some things have been seen over this life, very interesting and anomalous. But in that moment, there was a subtle vision, and it was of all our loved ones on high, so to say. All the spirit guides, angels, saints, benevolent ancestors, and I felt some of my Catholic conditioning coming in Jesus, Mother Mary, the Catholic saints, and God, and Him, Her, I am that am self, suddenly were just showering me with grace. Hmm. I felt so lucky, so grateful. And everything after that was entirely different. My life had changed from all wrong, suicidal, utterly depressed, to absolutely all right. Uh, it's it's interesting that uh, solid bliss of God. I just want to say ahead, um, it's interesting that you should have had that vision because I often get the feeling when I hear experiences like this that you know there has been some kind of blessing or some kind of grace uh, through you know some conscious entity you know uh, of a higher nature that it's not just some physiological shift or something that took place but that you know you had a calling a destiny or whatever and uh, you know you were kind of given that blessing at that time in order to step into it um, and you know it may have been something that was prearranged before you came into this life who knows but but I, I often get that feeling you know it, it just seems like a real possibility from my way of thinking um, and you've done well with that. I mean, you've made good use of it, which we'll continue to talk about as we go along here. Um, I, I would just underscore that, Rick. I mean, you're right spot on with that because this was sheer grace. I had nothing to do with this. Uh, there was nothing about deserving it. Uh, uh, and it wasn't just a physiological thing. I triggered endorphin chemistry and, and, and serotonin chemistry by being outdoors much of my life. And and all the sports activity and so forth. So uh, every morning, you know, up until all the injuries and the depression, I couldn't wait to get up and get out and be active and yeah. part of life. So it wasn't like, uh, you know, suddenly for the first time in Timothy's life, some decent serotonin is flowing or <laughs> uh, some endorphins. I've been running that chemistry since I was a little child. Yeah. Uh, well, this was very different. And, and it might very well be that the knee injuries and the depression were part of the scheme. 
You know? All right. Oh, yeah. We're going to injure this kid. You've got to get stripped. Yeah, we're, get... we're going to knock this kid down a bit because otherwise he's not going to want to have this breakthrough. <laughs> there has to be a real emptying out. And however that occurs, I, I don't think one can deliberately empty oneself because then you're full of yourself trying to empty yourself. But if we just trust, if there's a faith that somehow the source of all of this miraculous, wondrous appearance is divine. Call it what you will, the Tao, the Buddha nature, life. Uh, some incredible super intelligence, super power is responsible for all this. And if you just kind of trust that this power that's putting you to sleep every night, refreshing you, dreaming your dreams, dreaming your big waking daydream of life, growing your hair, digesting your food, running your millions of enzymes per second. If you trust this power, sooner or later, I think it, there's no choice about this. Uh, this power will take over your life, transform you, and everything that was all wrong becomes perfectly all right. Yeah. Now, I kind of interrupted you because I wanted to interject that thing to emphasize. Oh, inter interrupt as, as much as you want. Okay, but I, now I want to get you back on track. So okay. I, I interjected that bit about, you know, the, the blessing. I wanted to sort of emphasize that a little bit more, that there yeah. seems like there was some sort of divine intervention which facilitated this. But you were about to say that everything was different after that, and I'll let you continue from there. Yeah. Well, so many parameters, if you will, uh, did change, yeah. Again, I wrote all of that up for John LeCay's Non-Duality magazine. For you and your viewers here, I don't want to make it too lengthy, and I have a reason, not just wasting time about someone's personal story, when, again, the real reality here is the super-personal divine, our true nature, what we look from, feel from, the unseen seer of seeing, the unheard hero of hearing, and so forth, is the... Our most ancient wisdom text, the Briya Daranyaka Upanishad, said about 3,000 years ago. The main reason I don't want to talk too much about it is I don't want anyone to feel like, you know, my life doesn't measure up the way his does. You know, I haven't experienced what he does. And then any subtle comparisons. The way I feel that everyone is just absolutely the fullness of God as they are. Mm -hmm. This particular life, no matter be it full of physical pain, emotional pain, uh, relationship trouble, uh, vocational job issues and challenges. I feel that each life is the absolutely superb manifestation for the moment in an incredible divine drama of such incredible beauty it'll just make you weep. And so if people started to get too fascinated by, you know, for instance, uh, you know, I start feeling all this sense of wonder moment by moment. Everything and everyone became precious. Uh, uh, that later what I learned, the old Sanskrit word, tatata, -ta -ta, the Buddhist term, uh, we translate as suchness. The Zen friends speak quite a lot about the suchness of each being, each life, each manifestation, be it animate or inanimate, uh, nature-made or man-made. Uh, you know, this preciousness of every phenomenon. Uh, the profound sense of wonder and gratitude, that was one specific quality that came in. Uh, later I would learn uh, in the Franciscan tradition, it's funny, just about four blocks down our steep hill here in Santa Barbara, uh, right up against wilderness and looking out to the ocean, about four blocks down there's a street called St. Francis Way. Mm -hmm. and I think it's so perfect every time I drive by that going downhill because St. Francis of Assisi, his way was not loving nature, but loving this tree and this bird and this little bug and this human. His love of humanity, again, it wasn't a generalized abstraction for him. It was this human being whom he got to meet, this human being whom he got to meet, mm. be it a leper or one of his fellow friars or you know, one of the institutional church people or a peasant farmer. So this suchness quality in this Franciscan way, which I hadn't read about at that point, later on I would read about it, this became very profound for me. I would often just spend hours just uh, you know, gazing at a shrub, uh, the lighting on the leaves, feeling the, the life power that was in that shrub. What was it like to be a shrub? Uh, we not, may not consider it a person, but I didn't consider it inanimate. And somehow lit up with the personal energy of the super personal God. Mm. 
So this quality of ongoing wonder and tremendous appreciation for each being and the suchness, uh, and that's what, if you will, antidoted me to when I later began to read a lot of this very powerful Advaita literature from age 18 onward. That's another part of the story. Uh, you know, so much of that is neti, neti, not this, not this. That line itself also comes from the ancient Briya Dharanya Upanishad, our most ancient wisdom text on the planet. Uh, all that deconstructive, disidentifying, negating what in Christian mysticism is called apophatic, uh, via negativa, negating way mysticism, all of that happened for me in a context that was already so full of the via positiva, the positive way of hmm. not negation, but affirmation. Not affirmation of me. I felt like no thing, just open up for God. What was so spectacular was the affirmation of everyone and everything. And so a certain kind of narcissism that all kids basically have until they learn some amount of empathy, uh, you know, what it's like to really fully feel into a fellow human being or any kind of sentient being. That narcissism had suddenly given way, I won't say perfectly or completely, mind you. Uh, don't anyone put me on any kind of pedestal because uh, there's been some narcissistic behavior since then or you know, just basic selfishness, a, a lack of perfect empathy in certain situations, that's for sure. Uh, the human act is, is a case of you know, perfection perfecting itself perfectly, as an old Taoist friend said, because let's face it, the human being is full of imperfect conditioning, conditioning that's not virtuous or wholesome, but full of all sorts of forms of selfishness and greed, again, lack of empathy, lack of love, kindness, generosity. So, but I have to say that suddenly the orientation has shifted from all about me to all about who is this? What's it like to be you? What's it like to be this fellow human being, this shrub, this little bird singing on the branch, or the little bug that came from the screen, appeared on my uh, my desk in my study. I told John McKay, I actually had a, I, I bought a little magnifying glass I could keep in my desk drawer so that when certain little bugs sometimes came to visit, especially on spring and summer, fall nights, I could kind of gaze at them, mm. and eye to eye, Sometimes my two eyes to their four eyes, or however many they had. And uh, just contemplate, what's it like to be this fellow being? So and you're saying that uh, this happened yeah. at, at the age of 16. All of a sudden, you, made, you kind of had this 180-degree turnaround, and you started, to, and you had that orientation, looking you know, lovingly at every little thing, large and small. And uh, did people notice a change in you, your friends and family? I think what happened to Timothy? Oh, yeah. That was rather interesting. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, in the home life, it became a source of disturbance because my mother, I relayed a story for John McCain in that magazine. Uh, my mother and my sister secretly thought I was on drugs. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, one night uh, in particular, I remember, this would have been a number of days into it. And mind you, about four days into the uh, total change or whatever you wish to call it, uh, the opening, uh, my mother said, you know, Timothy, you seem so happy all the time. I said, yeah, Mom, something just happened the other day. Everything's completely different. I just feel like God is inside us and all around us, and, you know, everything's precious and sacred. And she said, well, you know, you've probably had some kind of a religious experience. You might want to read the Bible. So I actually sat down one night, it was probably a week into this transformation and just began to read the Gospels. I didn't read any of the other stuff, the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh. I didn't read the epistles or, thank God, I was spared reading the book of Revelation, the worst thing that ever happened in that Bible. All that apocalyptic uh, obsession and dualism and paranoia. No, I just started reading the Gospels and it was clear to me Jesus was this God abiding, God permeated mystic and he was sharing what it's like to live God and invite everyone into the same divine party of non-dual bliss. Maybe, may we be one with the Father as I am one with the Father, as he prays in that Last Supper discourse in John. So I began to read the Gospels. Catholic kids aren't encouraged to read the Bible like Protestant children are. Uh, so it was kind of a revelation for me, because we'd always just get little dribs and drabs from the 
a pulpit in a church on Sundays. And I had been an altar boy and you know, heard the little passages from the Gospels uh, during the homilies and so forth and the readings, but I'd never really gone through it. So that was, to me, confirmation that we could live this completely God-filled life, uh, emptied out of self for God. This line really struck me powerfully early on uh, where Jesus enjoins or invites people to lose your life for the everlasting life, the divine life. So I uh, began to read the Gospels, and then it got even deeper and more profound. And so one night, for instance, my dad was off while working. He had his own uh, literary agency in Hollywood, working with writers and directors. He'd given up working on actors and actresses years before. A little too much trouble. But uh, he was uh, getting jobs and breakthroughs for all sorts of Hollywood uh, uh, writers and directors and this sort of thing. And so he uh, would sometimes not come home till about 6.30 or 7. And my mom sometimes liked to feed us kids early so we could, uh, kids, my sister was uh, 15, I was 16, so that uh, we'd get our homework done, maybe, you know, whatever, get out and play. So uh, one night, I remember in particular, my mom is saying something like, so, Timothy, how was school today? I said, Mom, that was back then. <laughs> That's a memory. Right now, can you feel just how vivid, how powerful it is? Can you feel just God vibrating all of us? Uh, and uh, I noticed she shot a glance over at my sister, but I was still focused on my mom, and I'm wanting to talk more in this mode. And after a while, uh, my mom kind of made some kind of signal to my sister, and she excused herself from the table. My sister began to converse with me, asking questions what it was like in the state I was in. And uh, about 20 minutes later, my dad comes storming through the door. My mom had gone off and called him on the phone. Uh -huh. And uh, he came to, storming through the door, using expletives I won't repeat here. You know, <laughs> what the friggin' hell is going on? Right. And uh, are you on drugs? And suddenly I just did this complete change and slipped back into a very non-mystical, conventional kind of self or persona, social role, and I reassured them. I just had a heart-to-heart -heart discussion. Mom, Dad, Sister, Kathy, I don't know what's happened, but it just all feels holy. It was actually from that time onward, we, we actually began to discuss, you know, the possibility of maybe, maybe becoming a priest or something, because mm -hmm. that was the only context I knew for living this. We didn't have, uh, it was actually the year the Est movement got born, but the human potential movement was really nothing, certainly nothing you would read about in the papers. My parents were lovely people, very kind, generous, uh, life-loving, fun-loving, uh, but they weren't mystics, really. There was nothing on our bookshelves at home about any of this. So uh, uh, what is curious on my sister, uh, when I was young with her, I was about eight or nine, and she was about seven or eight, for whatever reason, at one point, we began to spontaneously share spontaneous haiku kind of poetic sayings. Mm -hmm. Somehow we'd heard something about Zen, and we began to just speak spontaneous haiku to each other. Huh. So it's like already in our way we were starting to get a, maybe a little taste of the suchness yeah. of life. But uh, it was just at that point just kind of an innocent childhood thing. But the bottom line was I, I did realize that when one opens this profoundly, several things can happen. You can start, uh, the energy just becomes so bright, you become so here and now, so uh, present. Um, a lot of folks' energy level will not be comfortable with that. They're used to a more conventional way of being. And so I realized I can, in various ways, invite them into the same energetic mode I'm enjoying, but I don't want to be presumptuous, and I want to honor their truth. And so I realized I really need to learn the language of mystical expression so I can find meaningful ways to communicate this so it doesn't just blow people away. Were, uh, you, uh, were you maintaining awareness during sleep at that stage? Dreams, for instance, became lucid quite often. Uh -huh. uh, the deep dreamless life, I... I here and there, it was spontaneous. I would kind of come to clarity, you know, in the middle of the night. It was so clear. All of this was one big arbitrary dream, the waking state, the night dream state. Uh, 
I wasn't yet a Samadhi adept, uh, and not that that's been my focus for the remaining, you know, whatever it is, four decades since then. Um, later on, I did uh, practice consciously falling asleep, just letting go, get subtler and subtler. The brain, of course, as we know, is moving into you know, stage one, two, three, four sleep, and these slower brain waves from beta to alpha to you know, delta to theta. And uh, But I was happy to just go off to sleep. Mm-hmm. I wasn't really a yogi back then. So much of this was spontaneous. Yeah. I hadn't done anything to make it happen. I wasn't reading yoga texts or anything to try and keep the experience around. It, it was always available thereafter, the sense, this bedrock sense of joy. It was like my default state, mm-hmm. whereas the mind, the emotions might get a little agitated about this or that. It was so easy to just come back to this, uh, if you will, to use a different metaphor. It was like a buoy. just... Right. always comes back up. I was just curious because, you know, some people report that when they have an awakening, they, mm. you know, pure awareness is just maintained 24-7. And if they don't understand that, sometimes they think, what's the matter with me? Am I, do I have insomnia now or something? Because I never seem to lose consciousness, even though my wife said I was snoring or whatever. <laughs> it, doesn't, it didn't seem to me like I was sleeping. So I just wondered if that happened to you, but it's just a side point. Again, nirvikalpa samadhis have come, but... You know, that's not the focus. Uh, right. And it's so clear to me that what we are is already the open no thing. I have I have to be frank, I've always uh, uh, been somewhat critical, at least for myself. Others, it may be quite wonderful that they get lots of time in nirvikalpa, pure formless samadhi states. But for this one, uh, it was always so clear that we look from the no thing. Why try to make the mind no thing? The mind is this incredible instrument, as is the body, for sharing, communicating, creating, empathizing. Uh, so well, I wouldn't I say that. Was curious because I was very introverted as a kid. But if anything, these uh, openings uh, they opened up that introversion all the way to the no thing like source. Uh, again, the sense of the pure void. But it was so clear that the void was every one and everything as well. Formlessness was forming. Mm. The, the, the non-personal, if you will, was was personing, <laughs> and so uh, this it all became of one piece. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, we know that so many great mystics like Sri Ramana Maharshi, Saint Francis of Assisi, he wasn't just quote a nature mystic. He was spending eight, twelve, sixteen hours a day in formless or maybe savakalpa, near formless, subtle, subtle seed of love or divine contemplation in these long trance states. Uh, uh, Timothy was never really a trance mystic. I never seemed to have time for it. Mm-hmm. But I had all these involvements and, and opportunities. And The one time I have allowed for all these kind of uh, states of non-involvement and then all the long trips to India mm-hmm. and Burma, uh, where I could just sit around, there was nothing to do, there were no people in particular to see, you know, manuscripts to work on, school projects, service projects, anything. So, uh, so you know, you've taken us about a th- few weeks into this realization, mm-hmm. and you, you kind of re- learned how to modulate it so you didn't blow your, your family away, uh, and, you know, they began to realize you weren't crazy or, or on drugs. And at this point, I get the picture that you you must have begun to you know learn. You must have begun to want to um, understand this more and to seek out things to read or people to talk to who could understand it and who could talk to you about it. Um, so is, is that correct? I mean, you, you be, did you begin to read you know Eastern philosophy or or more Christian? That that happened a bit later in my senior year. Uh, this awakening happened uh, in the early spring, or actually late winter, it was February of 1971. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was born in, in the Gemini, June 5th, 1954. Uh, Virgo rising and Leo moon and a lot of plants, planets in Cancer for all you astrology uh, buffs. Incidentally, astrologers would be fascinated that it was in that 16th year that my Sun, uh, what's the word, progressed or transited into Cancer, which is a water sign. Hmm. So it really opened up the heart. Hmm. Geminis tend to be airheads, basically. Uh, 
more engaging, say, than the Aquarius. There's, I mean, my, my dad, late dad, was an Aquarian. Uh, uh, anyhow, well, you know, mainly what I want to do is just share. It made me something of an extrovert. So many people socially, like high school and neighborhood and so forth, we all just suddenly were hanging out a lot, and uh, people wanted to know what had happened because uh, they knew that suddenly... <laughs> I had never touched drugs, but they all thought I was on drugs, and then found out I, I wasn't on drugs, and they wouldn't know how do how do we realize that? So I was uh, basically inviting people just to relax. I would sometimes sit with folks one on one and just invite them to change viewpoints. Mm. Imagine you're Timothy, and I'll imagine or intuit deeply. Then, wow. Mm -hmm. And did that work for people? Uh, some people who'd actually done quite a lot of LSD and psilocybin, all sorts of creative uh, openings, uh, some of them were blown away. It was too much like spiritual vertigo when I would invite them just into this pure open being or awareness mm -hmm. or openness. And uh, they wanted something to fixate on, hmm. uh, be it a vision or a practice. Uh, uh, my sister, some months after this opening, she and my aunt went off and got initiated in TM, uh -huh. uh, but it never held any appeal for me. I felt like the whole universe was vibrating as mantra sounds. Sometimes mm -hmm. I just listen to the sounds of you know, traffic or the wind in the trees or some like the hum of the refrigerator in the kitchen or something, and it was just revelatory to me. Uh, so I didn't feel the need to seek out methods. What did happen, and I shared this for John, I've shared this a few times because it's a fun story, a delightful math teacher we had in high school, uh, Father Colosimo. He was probably fresh out the boat about 30 years earlier, this Jesuit math teacher down at my high school, Loyola. He said something one day in math class, uh, I believe it would have been algebra class, and it kind of piqued my interest. I thought, well, maybe this is someone I could speak to in more depth about this, because no one in my social circle and in the adults I knew seemed to be open to any of this sort of thing. Or if they did, you know, they were sympathetic, but not knowledgeable. So Father Colosmo said something one day, and I thought, I bet he knows something. So I asked to see him after class, uh, after school that day, and so he said, sure. So I met him on the steps of the rectory right next to the big classroom building in downtown L.A. And uh, uh, after a few words, he invited me up into the hallway. And then after a few more words, he invited me over into this big uh, kind of parlor room, living room, whatever you want to call it, uh, because I could sense he wanted to talk about stuff that maybe would be dangerous if it was heard uh, by other uh, priests or novices or students. So we began to talk, and just very quickly, I was saying to him, Father, you know, it says in our catechism and what we hear in the pulpit and the sermons on Sunday that, you know, God is not on earth. God is the creator of earth. That God is up there. We're down here. God is separate from us. But is this really true? Sometimes it feels like God is inside us, all around us, and we're not separate. And Father Colosimo's eyes just lit up. And he looked both ways to make sure no one was listening. And then he looked at me, and his eyes were just beaming light, radiantly, almost twinkle and zest. And uh, he said, yes, Timothy, he said, uh, in the mind of man, there is separation between man and God. In the mind of God, and then he looked around again, left and right, he says, Timothy, in the mind of God, it's all God. And in that moment, he was so lit up. And it was such a beautiful, blessed confirmation for me that one could just allow God to be all in all. You know, well, in God is we supposed to be omnipresent, right? I mean, so if he's omnipresent, sure. how could he just be up there? I mean, you know. And that's what I really tuned into, like with those gazing exercises I would invite people into. Uh, mm -hmm. It wasn't really an exercise. It was just an experience, an invitation to be each other. Because whereas it was so clear about the power of now, this was before Ram Dass wrote his book, or Eckhart Tolle wrote his book, uh, and I hadn't yet read it in the ancient Christian mystics as I would start to delve into it. Just as so, it's so obvious, now is the only moment, and whereas this now is momentary, the Buddhists were so 
uh, savvy or Buddha himself pointed out trillions of events per second. It's all fleeting. That's the fleeing now, the, the nunc fluens, but the nunc stands, as an ancient Roman philosopher distinguished, the now that stays, that stands, uh, the eternal now. This is the now we're always uh, uh, part of and in which all the passing, changing, transitory moments occur. So there's a lot of emphasis in mystical texts and certainly in the modern mysticism we're having in America the last 30, 40 years. A lot of attention and focus on the now. But there's almost no focus on this radical, omnipresent here. Hmm. In other words, when I look at you, I can think, Wow, this is a webcam, so I say, you know, you're a foot and a half away, but really you're in Iowa, which is, what, about 1,500 miles away from California. So if I think of you as an it, out there or over there, I've depersonalized you in a way. I've made you an object. I've cut you out of my here. Mm -hmm. But you know yourself, Rick. You know you are right here. Mm -hmm. And if you were deluded, if you were deluded, you would think, oh, there's that Timothy bloke out there in California, out there and it, hmm. out there. But you're not deluded. You know that I look from the same here that you look and feel and perceive and function from. So this became quite clear early on that there is, as you say, this omnipresence here. This is our true nature. So no one is distant from us. Lord Buddha, Lord Jesus, God, him, her, I am, self is right here where we are. I often would ask my mom uh, when she was trying to figure out what had happened to me, or dear friends, uh, I even uh, kind of challenged a couple of teachers at high school about this, uh, when they would speak of God and there was kind of the reference to the guy up there. I said, really now, where is God? And if we were to go as souls, quote-unquote, with the dropping of the body to a heaven, and God was, what, seated on a throne, surrounded by angels? What would we see? Would it be God as an it over there? Is this God's experience of God's self and God's experience of the divine within us? So I began to really challenge a lot of the received wisdom, the non-mystical kind of religiosity that would make God an it or the Buddha nature an it up there. And that's why... So many of the Neo-Advaita or Pseudo-Advaita texts today, they're always referring to the self as it. And that strikes me as just an abstraction. Let's talk about this here, what we are, what you are, what I am. Mm. And this makes it real. This owns it. So it's not just an abstraction for the mind. Uh, so when you begin... When you began to challenge it, did you begin to challenge it openly, like in your classes at school? And, uh, oh, sure. Did you start getting <laughs> flack for that? Not really. I mean, maybe a little bit. One of the things that occurred with this opening is fearlessness, and I knew what we are. I knew what this truth of who we are is. And it's not something I can own or aggrandize myself with. Right. But... I won't say it was, you know, as fully brave and heroic as Socrates in ancient Greece, but definitely I was inviting people to question, mm -hmm. received wisdom, the CW, the conventional wisdom, which turns out to be uh, a lot of illusions and conditioning. And God bless everyone. Uh, so had it dawned there's... to you? Had it dawned to you at that point, um, mm -hmm. or, or occurred to you that what you were experiencing was what all the great mystics had been referring to, or hadn't that quite clicked yet? I began to read the mystics, but at first it was just Catholic mystics in books I could find in our high school library. That wasn't a big collection. Uh, at some point I found Meister Eckhart, uh -huh. the real Eckhart, the one 700 years ago who shared all about uh, the God beyond God, and, and God is simple, man is complex, God is at home, man is abroad, out in the mind, all in the wanderings. Uh, in my senior year, we did get a basic, heavily Christian-biased little primer for a high schooler on world religions. Mm. And I remembered being dazzled by some of the stuff revealed therein, but I didn't have the wherewithal or the knowledge of resources to be able to find that myself. So basically what happened was, as a, after graduating high school, I wound up going to the University of California at their Santa Cruz campus. I'd been attending UCLA 
uh, down in Los Angeles, uh, advanced placement courses. They let us high schoolers do that so we could get a taste of college before we actually went off for the collegiate experience. So uh, I went off to UC Santa Cruz and uh, double majored in religious studies and psychology. I felt they needed each other. They go together. I learned about transpersonal psychology within a uh, year or two. But that very first quarter up there in Santa Cruz, there in the wonderful redwoods with the moisture, the rainfall nightly almost, the beautiful sunny days, the oceans, and the hills and forests, the rock quarries. I met a very interesting chap named Dan McClure. Dan, wherever you are, we haven't kept touch for so many years. Wow, so much gratitude here for thee because he gave a guest lecture in Professor Noel King, the beatific, venerable old Noel King, the chair of religious studies at the UC. Uh, he'd been a missionary in Pakistan, uh, growing up there with missionary parents. He taught a basic uh, religious studies 101 course, and Dan McClure was invited in like week two or three to give a guest lecture. He was a graduate student in the History of Consciousness Department at Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. <laughs> they had a whole department and, uh, for the History of Consciousness? Yeah, they did. Uh, you know, it involved anthropological studies and right. uh, cross-cultural psychology and so forth. They didn't really have consciousness studies the way we know it now, say, from the Journal of Consciousness Studies and right. the work of David Chalmers and uh, uh, so forth, Arthur Dykeman and these lovely people who made it clear to science that, hey, what do you do about this fundamental challenge? What is consciousness? Without consciousness, you don't have your theorems or, or field work or computer screen readouts, so consciousness is primordial. You've got to solve what this is before you can figure out what is energy, matter, space, time, and so forth. Anyway, uh, Dan, he had had bouts of polio as a youth, so he limped uh, through his adult life. He uh, uh, dressed kind of old-fashioned with tweeds, a little tweed tam or a cap, smoked a pipe. He was only about 28, but he was like a throwback to some older soul from ancient Europe. He basically gave his guest lecture on esoteric Christianity, the occult. Arcana tradition in the West. I ran into Dan about two days after that lecture, and I introduced myself. Hi, Dan. I'm Timothy. I heard your lecture the other day in, in the big religious studies class. He goes, oh, yeah. And he's looking at me really funny. He had these very beautiful, pale, electric blue, piercing eyes. And he was looking at me kind of funny, and uh, I must have made just a little more small talk, appreciative of his lecture. And he suddenly interrupted and he said, you've never done drugs, have you? I said, no, but how do you know these things? He says, well, I see things. Hmm. turned out, I found out later from some of his students, that the police department would hire him from time to time to find missing persons, uh, uh, to clear out haunted houses and this sort of thing. When they needed a psychic, they turned it down. Hmm. Turns out his father, grandfather, great-grandfather, they'd all been 33-degree Scottish Rite Masons. He was one, but he was teaching a little tutorial on esoteric Christianity, the holy arcane tradition of white magic, invoking archangels, uh, doing white magic for the healing of the planet, uh, the healing of certain beings, uh, spiritual elevation of all beings. Beautiful, beautiful guy. So he invites me to this tutorial that was happening a few days later. He had this little weekly afternoon tutorial of just a handful of students, and he invited me to come join. They'd been students of his, I guess, for a few years. So I was the newbie. So I walk into this largely empty classroom with just Dan standing there, close to the, the table with a few chairs and a few of the students, maybe just three of them. And I sit down, and what's the first thing that happens? Dan looks at me very intensely, he says, who are you? And I looked at him, and at first I thought maybe he hadn't remembered the interaction of a couple of days ago. So I said, well, Dan, I'm, I'm Timothy. You know, we met a couple of days ago, and you invited me. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that. I know your name. Who are you? And I looked at him, and I said, uh, Dan, I'm a human being, hmm. no more, no less. Hmm. And he looked at me deeper, and he said, Who are you? 
I said, some old conditioning came up from Baltimore catechism. I felt like something, I didn't know about the Zen tradition and Mondo and koans and stuff, so I thought Dan was still looking maybe for some verbal response. So something welled up, the old conditioning from age six. I'm a child of God, here to love and serve God. <laughs> he goes, I know these things. I know you know them. And he says, the lips are flapping. The mind is generating beautiful concepts. Who are you? Beyond concepts, beyond self-labels. And we just enjoyed the silence, the mutual solidarity of just awareness beholding itself somehow in these two personal forms. And then at some point, Dan said, drop the personality. It's not what you are. It's an instrument. It's an expression. It's not who you are. Within a few moments, he said something like, <clears throat> you don't need to come to these uh, tutorials. This is more the way of the white magician, the way of working with the mind through affirmation, visualization, intention, invoking archangels and so forth for the healing of the world. He said, there's another path for the healing of the world. That's the way of the mystic. He said, Timothy, you're a mystic. Read everything you can about Sri Ramana Maharshi of India and the Advaita Vedanta tradition of India and find everything you can to read on Zen, in the China and Japanese uh, traditions of Zen. He said, you won't need to come here. We'll keep in touch. We'll meet from time to time. If you ever have questions, give a holler. Turned out we would spontaneously run into each other here and there. And I think once I did call him up and we went and met over in his home for a while. Uh, but dear Dan McLaurin, that lovely gentleman, Ignored by society as, you know, someone who limped around, dressed old-fashioned, didn't seem impressive or charismatic. Not one of the beautiful people of Santa Cruz uh, on the outside. This man was all gold on the inside and uh, very knowledgeable. Already is like a 28-year-old about the great mystical traditions. As I shared with John LeKay in the non Epi magazine, Dan just set me right in the lap of the great Mahatmas. And uh, from that point on, I lived and breathed and drunk and imbibed Sri Ramana and uh, Shankara and, and Swami Vivekananda and Sri Ramakrishna and Ananda Ma and the great Chan and Zen masters. I also found Comrade Heyer's book, Zen and the Comic Spirit, and disturbed a lot of people in the library that day when I was, <laughs> was laughing and laughing out loud. Uh, so, that's a nice. Story. One more to say. I mean, yeah, that's great. Uh, well, I wonder if the, have you ever tried to find that guy, Dan? Done He's on the anything? internet. You know, I should use things like Skype and, and links. Well, what is it? Facebook and so forth. I'm not a social networker much. Yeah, you community. could track him down. You know, get, yeah. his, get in touch with him. Have a Skype call with him. You know, there's kind of a sense of completion. Uh, yeah. So too, where. We know what we are and that we permeate each other. We intermingle each other. He's not that body. I'm not this body. Uh, right. and, but, man, what gratitude I've always had mm. for Dick. He was, if you will, in addition to whatever intelligence first, who a resonance opened me up in that backyard looking out over the view in, in Southern California when I was 16. It was Dan uh, early in my 18th year. It would have been like around September of uh, 1972. Uh, he... Uh, was really my next guru, if you could say. Mm. And he turned me on to Sri Ramana and the inner guru. So you started reading Ramana and Ananda Maima and all these um, great teachers. Did you feel like practicing anything, or did you just was it sufficient just to read and have that resonate with you? Yeah, this way of understanding that goes so deep. I mean, there is the ancient triple method. The Brihadaranyaka Upanishad identifies it as do a few later Upanishads as the Shankara in the Buddhist tradition, uh, especially Nagarjuna goes into this. It's the triple method of hearing the non-dual absolute level truth about who we are, 
the deep pondering or reflecting or contemplating this. The Sri Nizargadatta, whom I got to spend a lot of wonderful quality time with in January 1981, said, you know, when his guru said, you are God, your joy is divine, your sorrow is divine, you are basically the Lord Atma of this universe. Sri Nizargadatta, he was known as Maruti back then, he, he came away from the meeting transfixed, and he felt, you know, that's a very respectable man. He's a guru, a sage to many. He wouldn't just give me some high-flown concept. How is it that these words are really true of this consciousness, its source? How, how is it true that the divine is right here? That's who I am. So that intention then, what Sri Nizargadatta Maharaj always called the earnestness, Shankara calls it Numupshatva, the great longing or intensity for having truth be true of you. Uh, let it take over your life. Uh, uh, that pondering is the second stage after the hearing of the truth or reading of it in, in scriptures or sagely aphorisms like uh, the I Am That collection of Sri Nizargadatta that I found in 1979. Uh, that then leads on to nidhi jasana, shravana manana. Shravana is hearing, manana is the mental pondering, contemplating. And then nidhi jasana, the deep meditating as truth, or if you will, truth is meditating you. God is meditating you. So the way was very much summa iru as Sri Ramana and Swami Gyanananda, a great, great sage who lived a little bit south of Sri Ramana down in Tudor Koiler. Few people know about him, a tremendous jnani. Uh, anyway, uh, these guys would always share with ripe aspirants, Suma Iru, be still. As the old Sai Baba of Shirdidi, uh, the old Sai Baba said, uh, you know, just be still and I will do the rest. Hmm. So you let God take over your life and Again, I was never much of a yogi. I learned hatha yoga early on. I learned, you know, the sun salute in a bunch of postures. I learned yogic forms of concentrative meditation. You know, Vekagrata, just getting very one-pointed on, you know, a visual focus or a auditory focus like mantra or, you know, whatever you can one-pointedly focus on. But for me, Shankara's definition of Vekagrata was always the one that was so obvious, self-evident which is feeling and perceiving and intuiting whatever phenomenon or being arises for you as the oneness. Hmm. So meditation for me was uh, more this open rather than narrow down, concentrated, kind of a kakarata, one-pointed focus. Did you do it as, a, as an actual practice where you would set aside time to sit and meditate? and, and Yeah, there were periods where there would definitely be a regimen that... Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember uh, when, uh, gosh, I guess I would have been about 20, my sister had uh, uh, gone out to Hawaii, but right before she did, I came down and spent a few months with her and my parents. I took a year off from Santa Cruz, uh, and basically, I have to tell you, in between, uh, one of the passions where I was spending a lot of the time wasn't even reading mystics or just being, just gazing, just appreciating. It was... Uh, Learning to play guitar. My sister stuck a guitar in my hands when I was about 18, saying, you can't just meditate all the time and contemplate nature and God. Why don't you learn to play music if you don't have a sports career? Mm -hmm. You know, this will be fun. So she taught me a few chords, and I turned to, took it from there, learning, you know, folk and jazz and rock. And have have you kept up with it? Level of classical. Oh, I let so much of that go. At a certain point, you just let all attachments go. Huh. Uh, but uh, it's still Re there. You recently, know, the, uh, the bass player of the Mahavishnu Orchestra got in touch with me and wants to do an interview. His name is Rick Laird, and, and I'll be doing that. But he, you know, he's good buddies with John McLaughlin and all. Sure, I was listening to all that stuff back in the uh, yeah. early mid '70s. Great, great material, man. These guys talk about musicianship and yeah. skilled level of attainment in music. These guys are like special Gandharva, <laughs> celestial musician beings. Yeah. So. Uh, I was actually spending a few hours each day at least, sometimes seven, eight hours a day, just uh, playing guitar and having fun, singing songs with friends. Uh, nice. And later all of that would become in use when I was invited to play the harmonium in a spiritual center up in San Francisco and mm -hmm. uh, learned to sing hundreds and hundreds, probably at this point a thousand or more bhajan mm -hmm. songs. Um, uh, 
uh, I never felt a need to make a spiritual career out of it and charge money. For me, it was always just singing for the love of God with whoever, however many wanted to gather. Hmm. So all of that started going on from around age, uh, well, around 1979. So um, how old were you when you first went to India, or are we getting ahead of the story for me to ask that? Oh, again, it's a long, boring story. As I told John McKay, there was a funny, funny thing that happened once, a, a dinner party with dear friends in the... No, oh, I don't know, about 1985, I attended, and someone brought, as their potluck item, a bag of Chinese misfortune cookies. Not <laughs> fortune cookies, but misfortune cookies. Uh -huh. And I remember one person got the, the fortune, your spouse will become famous as an advocate for celibacy. <laughs> and the fortune this guy got here, Timothy, was, uh, yours is very long an uninteresting story. <laughs> so, uh, again, it has a certain fascination, but, you know, it's not that fascinating. Well, what was it, Ama, the hugging mother, Ama, Mata Amrita Nandamai, says, cease to be fascinated by anything except God. Hmm. So, uh, oh, yeah, the India trip came together. I'd gone off to college, uh, you know, back up to Santa Cruz from my junior and senior year. Uh, my sister had passed on. What a dear spiritual light she was. She had people out in Maui, Hawaii, calling her their guru hmm. when she was 19, and they were of all ages. I met people uh, on the island after her passing who said things like, your sister turned me on to God. Hmm. What had happened was when I went off to college as a freshman, she ditched out of her high school uh, senior year, the Catholic girls' high school, uh, they were giving the girls a chance to finish early, but she left even earlier to pursue a music career back in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Some guy who was smitten by her and wanted to introduce her to the Nashville music scene. She left that, thought it was all very worldly, wound up with the Rainbow People in Wyoming or mm -hmm. Montana, wherever it was being held that year, the big summer festival. And she was uh, doing a lot of mushrooms, smoking a lot of grass, and dropped some acid and found God. And wound up coming back, making amends with my parents. There had been parental daughter stuff, you know, about not wearing a bra and not shaving into the armpits, you know, it was the uh, flower child movement. My sister was a wonderful flower child. She really healed that relationship with them, and then she went off to live out in the islands, wound up on the east coast of Maui, the boonies, very undeveloped, largely caring for a blind man there, hmm. uh, and traveling around, and she welcomed me. I blew all my money on Oahu on a visit out there and went over to Maui and she and her friends were all on food stamps and they turned me on to vegetarianism and just the lightness and clarity of eating that way. I had just been loading myself up with Big Macs right up until the end when I flew over to Maui. Hmm. And uh, that also makes a difference. It's purifying and cleaning out your diet. Mm -hmm. But while we were there, spending about a month traveling all over, she was showing me all the incredible places on Maui. Uh, many of which have been developed, like the southern beach areas. There was no development back then. And we took a hike through Haleakala Crater. You know, it's, there's a real high side, about 11,000 feet up. And then you hike down into the crater and down at that lower slope. It gets increasingly more and more lush. Previously, it's like a moonscape in the depths of that crater, and then it becomes very lush. And then it drops down to this gorgeous, long coastal promontory terrain and a set of uh, waterfalls and pools leading down to the ocean, the so-called Seven Sacred Pools, the Ohio Gulch area. And one night, she went up with some friends. She had not been doing any hallucinogens for some months. Uh, she was meditating most of each day, as was I. And uh, that night, she met some friends. They wanted to do LSD with her. And I kind of looked at her like, and I thought, oh, that was behind you. You didn't need or want that anymore. But she decided to go off. There had been triple rainbows that day. We were going to be flying home to California. I was going to Santa Cruz. She was going to pursue a parapsychology major at Sonoma State. She had a boyfriend on the mainland she wanted to rejoin. And uh, uh, she went off and did that acid trip, I guess, as one like final way of just being completely one with that beautiful nature of that paradise of eastern or southeastern coast of Maui. And she never came back. She apparently went swimming out into the ocean. No one swims in the ocean there. And she was a very great swimmer. My dad was actually an Olympic caliber swimmer. He's one of the two alternates that they had beyond the four main swimmers who did all the events. They would have two alternates. My dad was one of them in 1948. My sister was an even better swimmer than I was, and I had been on the swim team in high school. Uh, anyway, uh, 
She had a better breast stroke and butterfly stroke. Anyway, she went out swimming in the ocean, and a rip must have caught her, and she was never seen again. Mm. And uh, I had all these amazing dreams of her thereafter. Not that night of the day she passed on, but the next night and the night after, where she was just all lit up with radiant light, and it was all very interdimensional and sparkly and glowy, and she was saying, now please, Timothy, tell everyone not to worry, not to be full of sorrow or grief. This is absolutely wonderful. You know, what we're made of, God's love for us, uh, God's welcoming us all, all back home into the light. It's beyond words. Please tell everyone not to worry, not to grieve. We're all together in spirit. So that was a tremendous uh, inner strength and consolation. I still missed her on the outer level. Tears were shed. You know, I, I felt nostalgic of it all the times we shared. We've been very close as a brother and sister. So I went back up to Santa Cruz the junior year and, and then senior year and finished that double major, psychology, religious studies. And uh, a few years later, went to the California Institute of Asian Studies, now known as the Institute of Integral Studies, and wound up going, uh, after finishing my master's in one year in East-West Psychology, I went out to Burma with the dear Buddhist Ten Precepts nun, Rina Sirkar, who's a professor of Buddhist studies there, and got to ordain as a monk way up in the boonies of northern Burma with a couple of buddies under a tremendous spiritual master, uh, Tong Pudlo Seyadaw. That man had the most beautiful voice of any human being I've ever heard. It was like a voice from Nirvana. And uh, then I got the chance to go over to India. Rina Sirkar's brother and sisters had all moved there when the country, Burma, had become nationalized. They donated a lot of land and wealth to the Buddhist Sangha. So that's why we got to have such high quality, very, very special privileged time up there in northern Burma. And they extended the visa specifically for us. But then I'd wanted to get to India because I wanted to see Sri Nizargadatta before he dropped the body. I knew he had throat cancer and wasn't long for this world. Mm -hmm. So we came into Pondicherry where Rina Sirkar's brother and sisters lived. Uh, and then I straightaway hightailed it over to Sri Ramana Maharshi's Ramanashraman and the old Adonachaleshwara temple and the holy Mount Adonachala there in uh, December of 1980. And... Uh, I didn't want to spend too much time there, although it felt like home. And Anamalai Swami, a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful spiritual son of Sri Ramana, he invited me to stay there indefinitely and just live. I think I was there. in India at the same time. I was up in New Delhi at that point. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. And up in Rishikesh? But I didn't get up there. I, I, I was over on a course with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi for about four months yeah. in New Delhi at that point. A uh, small world. Yeah. I wish I had headed there. south, actually, and, and found Amma at that point, but uh, I didn't know about her. But anyway, continue your story. I, I, should... yeah, I wound up meeting like Sri uh, uh, Mani Swami up at Virupaksha Cave, and that's where the whole revelation really came totally clear. We are Shiva, formlessness, and our play as Shakti is not separate from what we are. Forms are formlessness. Formlessness is forming. In that little hot cave there in Virupaksha, where Sri Ramana had spent quite a lot of time as a, as a youth when he first came, after being down at the uh, temple and the mango orchard, he went up onto Adonachala, and that cave, and Skanda Ashram cave, is where he spent most of his time. And that place was just still buzzing with this truth revelation of Shiva, Shakti, Natsu, somehow apparently distinct, a source, awareness, open, infinite, birthless, deathless, yet also creating, dreaming forth, emanating these gorgeous worlds, and, uh, and it's somehow not too. Shakti is Shiva, Shiva is Shakti. That all came quite clear in that cave. Mm. And then uh, I met people like wonderful Yogi Ram, Surat Kumar, Ramji, what a God-drenched beautiful mystic is Yogi Ramji. He dropped the body some years ago, but I had some wonderful one-on-one -on -one time within long hours and the night and the day. But I was feeling the urge to get out west uh, up to Mumbai, Bombay, as we knew it then, to see Sri Maharaj. So I went out west. I stopped at Sri Satya Sai Baba's ashram. Lovely energy, much spiritual experience there. Only much later did I find out, then I wrote a long web page, uh, my concerns about Sri Satya Sai Baba, which made me the object of the 
internet stalker, terrorist hitman, as he's been called, the guy who's created about 12 negative pages about me, which flood the Google returns when you try to search. Is that Joe Moreno? Yes, dear, dear Joe. Yeah, I just ran across him today, actually, because um, I have this chat group called Fairfield Life, and um, Mm -hmm. someone on there... Uh, Connie Larson was, I, I don't know, mm-hmm. I, I know Connie, and, and and somehow this whole connection came around, and, and somebody made some comments about Sai Baba or something on Fairfield Life, and this guy came zooming in and started making comments, and I, I just became aware of the guy's existence today. But I remember years ago reading your, your bit about um, Sai Baba, and um, anyway, that's, oh, a, an that's a diversion. I, <laughs> story that is, yeah. But my experience with Satya Sai Baba had always been wonderful, and and it was later when I found out tragically what was happening, not just to young adults, but then finally I heard about uh, legal minors, uh, boys 15, 16, 17. And that's when I and a number of others felt we have to speak out. Right. And so I left the movement. I had actually been one of the budget leaders and so forth in, uh, in San Francisco. And they made me president up there when I returned from India. It was a spiritual household, old buddy of mine, grad school uh, mate. Uh, invited me there, and uh, I spent some happy years in the 80s finishing grad school, learning all these gorgeous budgeons and being involved in service projects. Wonderful people. So the Satya Sai Baba Ashram was just a little interim state. Uh, Ramana Maharshi was my first guru, Satguru, if you will, and I needed that connection, but I wanted to press on. So I went out west and, and basked in the... Uh, wonderful vibes of Swami Ram Dass, not the American Ram Dass, but Swami or Papa Ram Dass, the great Carolan saint of southwest India who met Sri Ramana and uh, always chanted Sri Ram, J Ram, J J Ram, a beautiful man, uh, mandala kind of ashram arose around him and his successor, Mother Krishnabai, whom I had some wonderful, wonderful time with, and uh, mar- marvelous Mahatma, Mother Krishnabai, a true. Para Bhakta, a supreme Bhakta or devotee, non dual, Abheda Bhakti, and a pure jnani, pure wisdom sage. And uh, someone there at the library gave me a little rare, not many copies in print, little biography of Sri Nizargadatta that I got to read on the 26 hour bus ride up to Mumbai, where I met Sri Nizargadatta in January of 1981. And uh, it was at Maharaja's that if there was anything of the search, well, most of that had been ended in that Paksha cave at Ramana Maharshi's ashram. Uh, Maharaj is with the one big, you know, how can we say, canine teeth of the Bengal tiger living in Mumbai. That was Maharaj, one mm. aspect of it anyway. He pounced <laughs> huh. and just finished off the Timothy character in terms of having any more questions, basically. Mm. I must say, there's another side of Sri Maharaj, which I would really like to just take a minute to sure. share. Because this side is simply not presented by all those who consider themselves part of the Navanath Sampradaya, the so-called lineage from Sri Maharaj and his guru, Sri Siddhartha Meshwar. Frankly, I think all this lineage-mongering stuff is baloney. And recently, John McKay was insisting I get my name somehow put up there on a list that are Dear friend Dennis Waite, uh, who's written several books on Advaita, uh, and finally he, and I'm glad he did, he wrote a kind of a correction book to kind of really distinguish out neo or pseudo Advaita and real Advaita. Anyway, uh, I think that book's called Pathway, Advaita, Pathway Through the Jungle or something like that. Uh, but his earlier books, there's a little indiscriminate mixing. And, and one of the things is in the neo Advaita, it's all this cutting via negativa. It's this is all just a dream. Right. Now, I wrote an award-winning essay back in grad school in 1983, affirming in all sorts of ways and documenting it from the sacred traditions how this is all a dream. That was the title of the essay. Mm-hmm. But it's quite clear to the sages that in our wisdom-cutting mode, the negating via negativa, we detach, disidentify, we destroy with a sort of manjushri to use the Buddhist metaphor, Bodhisattva Manjushri, we take that wisdom sword and just cut through all illusions and realize everything is, as the Buddha said, the marks of existence, anicca, anatta, dukkha, impermanent, 
therefore insubstantial, therefore not worth clinging to. So that's what wisdom does for you. It divests you of the illusion, the identification, the needless attachment. And compassion or love, the shakti, bliss, solidarity, the love of persons great and small, all creatures great and small, that makes you one with everyone. And Sri Nisargadatta, he had this slashing wisdom style that just left you nothing. Mm -hmm. It stripped you, diced you, pulverized you, evaporated you. And guess what? He had not only this total disidentified, uh, let's call it disidentifying mode, he had this complete identifying mode. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'll say that Nizargadatta's way was uh, kind of a little two-step. Mm -hmm. Even though we never go anywhere, don't need to attain or step anywhere. I'll just say that for the jiva, the one who gets enlightened through the clarification and the purification of the buddhi, uh, the highest aspect of the knowing faculty, the, the higher mind, the jiva has a two-step of disidentifying, and then there's this spontaneous re-identifying with everyone and everything. Mm -hmm. And Sri Maharaj, this beautiful Nisargadatta, the, it literally means without artifice, without any artificialness. Uh, I'll use the old Zen saying, no need to add legs to a snake, <laughs> Maharaj. Just this pure Shiva snake, you know. And uh, he just zapped you with wisdom. But he was also a great Abeda Bhaktan, this no difference oriented devotee. You should have seen him during the bhajans. The first night I came to the bhajans, I noticed where are all the Westerners? There were like two pious European ladies who were there, and no other Westerners. A number of the Indians came. And Maharaj saw, and he gave approval. He nodded, and he said something in Marathi, and a translator translated for me. Uh, his Argadatta said to me, he said, uh, he nodded his head, and he said, those who think they understand only come to the talks. Those who really understand come to the bhajans. <laughs> And it was during those bhajans that Maharaj would light up and, oh, it was just ecstatic. And, uh, you know, they had this big duffel bag and they'd pull out right before the bhajans all these big you know, symbols that you know, they use in the Indian uh, percussive way for the, the bhajan songs. Maharaj's symbols, they were about this big. Huh. And, uh, man, it was deafening in there. And some guy had a big brass gong. He'd just be beating the huh. heaven out of it. And uh, there was a complete din in there. And Marathi bhajans are not particularly musical. They have kind of a sing-song, rather monotonous kind of chant. But they're all like the old hymns of Sri Ganeshwar, the great non-dual Abheda Bhakti and Kirigani from the 13th century, and other hymns of Eknad and Tukaram and Sri Nizagadatta. Some of his songs were in the official collection of the Navnath Sampradaya. And all of these people that say they're in the Navnath Sampradaya from Nizagadatta and they're doing this lineage mongering and trying to make money off Sri Nizagadatta's name with books and tapes and CDs and everything, they uh, have completely neglected this side of the Maharaj. Which is why in my big, almost book length, booklet length, free offering on Sri Maharaj up at our enlightenedspirituality.org website, uh, I've talked about this other side of Maharaj, the very devotional side, and uh, there's a lot of energy. I remember one day he just came over and grabbed me by the shoulders, and he was looking at me, and, and he kind of moved me over about four inches and kind of looked at me. He was hitting those big symbols, keeping time, and he kind of put them down. He grabbed my shoulder and moved me over a little bit. I mean, this guy was working with energies and forces, and he was a... Uh, a wonderful guy, and there's so much more, so much uh, warmth and love, uh, a kind of a jocular, avuncular uh, closeness, intimacy, one-on-one -on -one with a translator. You know, I'd be pulled in and we'd talk uh, little times when no one else was around, and he uh, would share a tremendous warmth, and, and with that, a tremendous strength. His whole way was not to have you become a devotee in some personality cult, and the man would never charge a dime. He wanted nothing from you. He only wanted this fellow mutual celebration of what we are. Hmm. And the full formlessness of this, and then the full 
solidarity and love and and gladness of sharing this with each other. The final message Sri Nisargadatta would give to anyone uh, who thoroughly, quote, understood on the intuitive level about this was, now, no need to run around and monger after this or that. Uh, forget attainments and so forth. Go home. Be a good friend to your friends. Love your loved ones. Uh, if it spontaneously comes up, be of service in some way, and that will come. It will all happen spontaneously. It's like growing hair, said the Maharaj. Mm. He was a great Taoist, Zen mystic, and a Hindu cultural body. And uh, he was the complete teacher. And I, my concern, if you heard me being a little feisty there a few minutes ago, a bit critical of some of what's being done in his name today, is because I think a very stunted or truncated uh, side of uh, Maharaj is being presented to at the uh, expense of, to the exclusion of, all these wonderful other facets of the man. He was a very full, multifaceted guy. Well, I'm glad you did come back to that because it's been a recurring theme for me in these interviews. Um, you know, I've, I list, there's this, uh, I don't mean to pick on these guys because I really enjoyed listening to the... Earth. God love them. I mean, they're talking about one part of the trip. And yeah. Often tremendous brilliance or cleverness or absolutely wit. some of them are so articulate and yeah. so so clear and so well spoken like this this urban guru cafe website if you've ever heard of it where they're all sort of disciples of sailor bob adamson who actually was with nisargadatta, I mean, nisargadatta. yeah, yeah. Uh, but there's, very basic teaching about you know the isness yeah but the way is uh, uh, someone you know People send me stuff on various people. Mm -hmm. Once you've actually met Sri Nisargadatta and Anomaly Swami and people like this, you don't need to search out other teachers or something or try and check up on what everyone's doing. But people send me links, and I did take the time to hear what Sailor Bob is sharing. And that's a very lovely, simple, no nonsense, uh, very easy and accessible for most people. Uh, whereas the Timothy brain may have gotten a little overeducated with grad school and you know, the old joke about Ph.D. piled higher and deeper. <laughs> uh, uh, and I like to use the terms of our great sacred traditions. Why try to reinvent the wheel or pretend that you are the great source of this knowledge when, again, they've been talking about this in India for 3,000 years. Why not give credit where credit is due? So I like to quote a lot of our sources, a lot of our, our friends, our older brothers and sisters who bequeathed this great legacy you know, which can be the basis for this old jnana marga, wisdom way path of shravana, manana, nidhijasana, hearing, contemplating, and meditating on the truth. So, but Sarah Bob's way is, uh, it was Nisargadatta, one part of his teaching, any true jnani, you can't doubt that you are. There's a basic isness here that's indubitable. And this is Shankara's great critique of Buddhism and what helped restore Advaita Vedanta to the fore among the intelligentsia of India uh, 1,300 years ago. When you wake up from dreamless sleep in the morning, there's no doubt about a deep, deep continuity that's here. It's not the mind. It's not memory. It's not self-identifications. All of those come and go. They're not there in deep, dreamless sleep. And you're basically dead to everything. There's no you, no world, no agenda. Uh, we don't doubt this basic isness. No one doubts this. So Sri Maharaj would say, recede back as that, stay as that. And uh, I would also say, too, there's another point about Neo Advaita, or Pseudo Advaita, um, specifically in the works of Wei Wu Wei and my dear old friend Sri Ramesh, Paul Shekhar, the late Sri Ramesh, who spent time as a, one of the four or five translators of Ranshri Nisargadatta. I actually drove them around a little bit in L.A. and San Francisco and Tiburon and uh, helped set them some things up for them. But I needed to pull away because that pseudo-Advaita, because it's not the complete teaching, uh, it really comes down strongly when there's no efforts to be made. And yet the paradox of instruction that you find with Sri Ramana Maharshi, Shankara, Sri Nisargadatta, all the great, great dear ones who are helping us home in this journey from here to here, they're using the paradox of instruction that what you are, you cannot become. Effort, as Shankara and Nisargadatta and others said. 
You can only be this. So as Sri Nizagadatta said, just be. And don't get restless about trying to just be, just be. Nevertheless, you should have heard the many times he used the imperative verb form and, you know, those eyes would bulge and he looked so hyperthyroid in such moments or again like that Bengal tiger in Bombay just about to jump out and grab you by the jugular. He'd say, you must meditate. You must drop this involvement. Uh, what are you before you're born? You know, where were you a billion years ago? He used questions a lot to role model what it's like to be passionately, earnestly involved in real self-inquiry, to really shatter the illusions so that all the conditioning and mediocrity and the tendencies for ourselves to exploit others, uh, to be less than empathetic with other persons, to not be all that we can be uh, on the personal level as you know, an instrument for the expression by the superpersonal. Maharaj really wanted all that clear. He really wanted all the virtues there in full bounty. So he used the paradox that you are already the absolute, and yet the jiva, by the grace of God, does have the power, it seems, to have choice, the power, it seems, to form intentions, the power, it seems, to engage in practices, and he wanted that power used to the max. And I would also uh, distinguish here, most people only know Nisargadatta's meditation on the I am sense. Realize I am not this, I'm not the speaker, I'm not the listener, I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, I'm not male, I'm not female, I'm not this, not that, I am. Just meditate on this I amness, or beingness, or consciousness, as he called it. He said that through that method, one's personal consciousness would start relaxing, receding back unto its source, the universal manifesting consciousness. He had a word for it, Chaitanya, but we could also call it Shakti, the source of the many, the Om. And then by divine grace, one awakens as the Absolute, and one realizes one was worldless, personless, mindless, relationless, and that the whole play of the worlds and beings and, and so forth uh, it was all a marvelous Shakti play. Now, that's the meditation that most people are breaking their brains, uh, breaking their minds over is, you know, what is this I am? What is this beingness? People aren't usually aware that Sri Nizagadatta gave another way back home, so to say, in this paradox of instruction where you know, you must meditate, you must make efforts in this. His other meditation was a wonderful one for householders, and I think it's been the experience of so many folks in satsang I've shared uh, this with over the years. Meditate on the vital power. There's a dear chap, a naturopath up in Sebastopol, Northern California, Peter, I'm forgetting Peter's name, how could I do that? We went over to see Srinivasa in the summer of 1981, I believe it was July. Maybe because he was a doctor, a healing uh, professional, he drew out of Maharaj a more in-depth presentation of this meditation on the vital power than I've read in any of the books and conversations available on Srinivasa sharings. Namely, Sri Nisargadatta said, look, there's this meditation on the I am-ness. It's more of a cognitive form of contemplation. But why not inquire, what is this vitality, this power, this force, by which you can even lift a finger, or blink an eye, or feel a feeling, or think a thought, or launch an intention, like I should meditate on the I am -ness. What's the power? If you notice, with intuition, you'll notice, this power is shapeless, it's formless, it's not structured, it's not an object for the mind, for perception. There's a deep intuitive feeling that you are this vitality, and this, said Sri Nizagadanta, is de facto the god of your world. Without this vitality, nothing happens. You wouldn't get out of bed. You wouldn't have the power to be conscious of anything during the day. So he said, allow this vitality, this life force. Let this be the God of your world. Meditate on this. Be this. 
And I tell you, it's very easy to meditate on this while, say, washing dishes, driving the car, being in conversation with a uh, loved one, uh, so-called stranger. No one's a stranger when you come home to this. We're all the same one. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Um, this meditation from Srinya Zagadatta is a tremendous gift, and it uh, allows a certain focus for, quote, effort, intentionality, that earnestness. People would ask Maharaj, because he uses this word earnestness quite a lot, what are we to be earnest about? And he would say, be earnest about who you are. And again, there were two ways of realizing that, using this pure I am meditation to extricate oneself, to pull back from these illusory identifications with I am this, I am that, I am Timothy, I am Rick, I am so-and-so. Uh, and then come back home to open awareness. But this meditation on the vitality, the life force, he said this is equally good and for very busy householders will actually probably be preferable because you won't have the time and space to just sit around contemplating the I am. Whereas you can kind of feel the vitality in motion when maybe the brain mind has to be somewhat busy working at a computer, uh, setting an agenda for a work day, uh, dealing with children's health issues or whatever it might be, or, mm -hmm. or getting educated on political justice issues. <laughs> uh, that's good. So I, I haven't felt the need to ask you too many questions because basically I just think the questions and then you answer them. It seems uh, to be going that way. Um, so many people in satsang often say they came with all these questions. And, yeah. Uh, it's all just a flowing. So you would sort of summarize um, the whole Neo-Advaita issue as being that uh, many of the spokesmen for it these days um, are legitimate up to a point, are, are speaking truth up to a point, but they've kind of left out the rest of the story, to quote Paul Harvey. They, uh, it, there's a, a further development that can be uh, appreciated. I, I'm just summarizing, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, and that this whole emphasis which sometimes comes out about, uh, you know, it's it's not necessary to meditate, there are no degrees of progress, um, you know, all, all teachers who say they are are bogus, all you really need to do is sort of realize that you're that and you're done, forget this whole, you know, evolutionary process business. Um, you, I, I, I get the sense that you uh, would dispute that and that it may be true up to a point, but that's not the rest of the story. Yeah, to answer your question, I mean, God love these dear souls sharing in all the heartfelt ways. My concern is a lot of it is just excessively clever. It's a one-upsmanship strategy. Mm -hmm. If you look at relations between and among human beings, like it or not, there's power issues. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to use Advaita teachings to subtly or not so subtly one-up other people and get the edge. I mean, if we were introduced at a party and you made a conventional kind of extension of cordial good wishes and introducing yourself, and I pulled one of these one-upsmanship stunts like, you know, who had that history? Uh... You know, what's the source of that thought? Yeah, it's kind of a conversation a stopper. Thing. Yeah, and, and role play the guru and kind of force you into being a disciple. I find this stinks. It's a violation of what we are. It's a presumption that I'm the enlightened sage and you're not. And I have to tell you, honestly, when you wake up to this authentically, everyone you see is the divine. Everyone is a sage. And if temporarily in the ego g play of me uh, it seems like the being suffering and not so enlightened timelessly you know that they don't come from ignorance and suffering and limitation and that's not their destiny in psychic time and the great finale the uh, grand comedic climax where all souls are being awakened unto God and all the gross, gross nonsense is being left behind so we all know that we're Buddhas deep down. Why play the game of presuming I know and you don't know and become the terse talker? All these people that now feel like 
I've mastered silence. I rarely speak. You know, uh, if you're lucky, you'll get one of my pearls of aphorisms. You know. Well, that's also a sort of a, yeah. there's a sort of a cop out thing in too, in a way, because if you if you convince yourself that you're done and that there's no need for spiritual practice and that you've realized what yeah. you know the great realizers have realized, then that kind of lets you off the hook, you know. I mean, that yeah, sure does. <laughs> it's like the all truth right. is, we're not on the hook, and there's not any of us here. But it's part of the great leela, divine play, Krida, the great divine game, that. Jivas uh, need to undergo some deconditioning. They can drop the non-essential. They can drop the unwholesome qualities and uh, have the virtuous qualities be spontaneously growing and sometimes cultivated. As which is an, which is another yeah. important point because if you feel like you're uh, done, uh, then you may be totally neglecting. Uh, a huge area which is in need of improvement, you know, and which is in need of, of purification and, and culturing of virtue and so on and so forth. And we've seen all kinds of horror stories where, oh, pe yeah. you know, people have neglected to do that and, you know, have assumed, you know, yeah. teaching roles and sometimes very famous ones and then have really, um, you know, stumbled and fell. Um, yeah, when there's, you know, deep, aching loneliness for like a fellow human connection, but you've allowed yourself to get put up on a pedestal, sometimes through your own doing of playing kind of one-upsmanship power games, and then everyone gives you power, defers to you, especially people who are trying to replicate in some way a dysfunctional family system they might have come out of. They'll make you play that dysfunctional father figure above and give their power to you. And then you lose out on the kind of solidarity and deep interconnectedness and the feeling like we're really made of each other. We're one. Yeah. And so you start lording it over others, but then you've got these deep pangs of loneliness. And you need, you know, if you're a man, you might need the touch of a woman's body or something. And then people get very irresponsible with this, mm -hmm. uh, exploiting their students' bodies for their own sexual needs, mm -hmm. seeing women say as objects, uh, kind of. You know, women gurus, quote unquote gurus, have done this to male disciples as well. It doesn't just go the one way, although, unfortunately, it is largely the case that it's men that have abused this more than women. That's why I started that huge project of women in spirit and came up with that book, uh, The Mid 90s Women of Power and Grace, the last mm. chapter of which, as you may know, is all about our, our dear Ama. Yeah, I've seen that book. In fact, I saw that book years <laughs> ago and, and didn't, you know, connect it with you until just the other day when you mentioned you had written it. That was the first chance introduced to the official American book trade, the story of Obama. Mm -hmm. Neil Rosner's book had come out a couple of years earlier, but it wasn't in mainstream distribution, nor were uh, the two mm -hmm. books that had come out of India. So uh, mm -hmm. it was fun to hear the reactions from some religion editors in some newspapers and magazines. I won't mention names, but they were full of criticism. What is this? This woman is some kind of divine incarnation. You know, was all this Christian bias, basically, and thinking the whole thing was some cult. Well, those people have been forced to eat their words when the UN and so many interfaith agencies and so forth, the World Parliament of Religions, have just uh, fallen over each other, giving them all these awards for all of our incredible ministry of love and humanitarian projects. Mm. Perhaps I could, uh, we could talk about Amma in just a second, but I just wanted to wrap up sure. our, our previous point, which yeah. is, you know, just to, lest we be guilty of lording it over others, I just wanted to say that, you know, whatever, there's so many different things that people do, and, and it's, it seems that everything they do in the name of spiritual development is appropriate for them at that time. Uh, you know, for yeah. instance, uh, fundamentalist Christianity. You know, uh, personally, I have a problem with some of the, the way they behave in terms of my own you know, interaction with them, if it occurs. But for them, uh, you know, it, it, it saved many people's lives and transformed many people's lives profoundly. Um, not that it, it's, it's, not that it is. This is the case exclusively, but I heard someone say recently that fundamentalist Christianity happens happens to be very effective in helping gang members get out of that lifestyle and into a more wholesome one. Perhaps there's still the pack mentality and, and, and so on, but it's turned into a more, uh, you know, benign form. Um, and Although I do have to interject there and say uh -huh. that he was actually in the same graduating class as Loyola High School, Father Greg Boyle. He went on to become a Catholic priest. Is the uh, 
he's internationally famous for his homeboy ministry project down in the barrios of, of L.A. because mm -hmm. this progressive, Catholic, uh, not evangelical, fundamental right-wing guy by any stretch of the imagination, warm-hearted guy, he's done the yeoman work to uh, help bring gang members out of that milieu and, and bring them into a much lovelier life. And, yeah, there you uh, go. And also yeah. all, the, all the different neo advaita teachers that are so popular these days, um, you know, I, I have a lot of friends who really got into Gangaji and really got into, you know, this and that and the other thing. And, you know, some of them, a lot of them aren't doing that particular thing now. They're, they've gone on to something else. But they speak very highly of the benefit they derive from that. Uh, oh, and, yeah. Yeah, and now they're experiencing something new and deriving benefit from that, which they may or may not stay with. But, you know, we just kind of keep rolling along, and all these teachers are are contributing what they have to contribute. And many of them, their contribution evolves. You know, there are teachers who speak a certain way, teach a certain way, and then as their realization deepens, they think, well, wait a minute, there's actually more to this, and I, I was sort yeah. of shortchanging you guys. Now here's something a little bit more complete. Yeah, it's funny to watch some of these movements grow. They wouldn't even have the big followings had they, you know, early on given all this for free, not created big organizations, not played some of the one-upsmanship games to draw on all these needy, subservient, dear souls. So suddenly they've got these huge organizations and things are starting to get a little strange, maybe dysfunctional. And then suddenly they realize the teaching's imbalance. This isn't working. And so it's a, it's a fun thing. It's like a, it's like a bunch of people out on a lake Mm -hmm. on a boat without paddles and they have to improvise but they, everyone finds their way home the God self isn't going to leave anyone out in the cold mm -hmm. there's a beautiful old Christian teaching I found out actually it was from a, a rather conservative evangelical website that this was actually mainstream for many years I thought it was just the teaching of early church fathers like Clement of Alexandria uh, Origen uh, of Alexandria Gregory of Nyssa later uh, John Scotus origin in the ninth century, the greatest Christian non-dual theologian, I think, in, in Christian history, this ninth century theologian, they all taught this beautiful doctrine of apocatastasis. That's an old Greek word. It means universal salvation or liberation or redemption. And the teaching is basically God is God in all, and God's love is so all-loving, all-embracing, all-forgiving, all-powerful that no soul is going to be able to exile itself into strange states of megalomania and fear and hatred and self-loathing, other loathing, forever. In other words, the hells are self-created, if you will. But finally, God's going to find a way to waken you to God within the hell, and then it turns into heaven, and then it just turns into God. This is a powerful teaching. And when you're really living from the heart of this, that everyone is in God, of God, God is everyone, no one but the one and everyone, then so much fundamental sense that there's a problem here, all these neo advaitans and stuff, well, that just falls off. Also, too, the tragedies in history, like you know Hitler and six million dead in the Holocaust, Jews, gypsies, gays, and so forth, you know, that's just horrifying. Uh, and yet, we know that when souls drop the body, they are immediately pain-free, not subject to cold, anger, fear. And they're debriefed in the light by all the light beings, and then depending on their capacity for opening up all the way to the clear light, beyond the visible white or golden or blue light, the Christian or Jewish heavens, uh, you know, they are no longer suffering. So. Six million dead, yeah, on what I've come to call level three, the conventional world, the world of where there's justice and injustice, and it behooves us to be on the side of justice, not one of the perpetrators or their accomplices. Uh, there needs to be, you know, morality, ethics, cultivating the virtues, trying to remedy the wrongs with rights, healing. Mm -hmm. That's level three. And there's a lot of pain on this level, and not to acknowledge it is blindness, and it's a kind of closed and hard-heartedness. You can't feel the pain of fellow beings that are experiencing physical or emotional pain, the intensity of whatever situation they're in, either because it's, quote, their karma, 
you know, they hurt someone in another life, now they get pain. But it need not just be that. You know, people are often taking on the karma of others in their own intense situations. Sometimes it's just the atma testing itself to see, you know, how strong, how loving, how patient can you be when this is happening? How about when this is happening? So there's any number of reasons why people are undergoing certain intense, intense, painful situations. To close off one's heart to that, to say, oh, it's all just a dream, to say, that's not who you are, wake up from uh, a certain callousness or cruelty. And this is where Neo Advaita can lead to a kind of thing, a sociopath. I mean, Charles Manson had a certain Advaita teaching, if you read the historical record. Uh, he thought everyone was God, so if you killed someone or tortured and murdered them, you know, it's all God anyway. So, that's a complete forgetting of what the Buddha, Shankara, Nagarjuna talk about as the conventional level, the Vyava Harika or Sambriti Varta level of pragmatic experiential living, the beings and worlds and relationships. And then on level two, as I've, I've kind of inserted a level in between the old two levels, the two truth teaching of the great ancient masters, level two is this deep sense of the apocatasis says that we're all being liberated timelessly. We are all Buddhas. We are already realized beings. Uh, there's this pretense or play of being the soul associated with this earthly body and these earthly situations. But really, we are uh, right now perfectly in bliss, as bliss in our real nature uh, as souls. So that's level two, a psychic level truth, if you will, a heavenly level truth. It's still part of the relative, the many gazillions of souls. What's level one? Level one is there's only one being here, one awareness. Nothing has ever happened. Nothing is happening. Whatever seems to be happening is just an ephemeral dream. It's gone the next moment. As soon as you try and sink your teeth into it, it's already a, just a memory trace. So there's really only reality here. Non-dual, worldless. And yet it's somehow magically dreamlike playing as these worlds and these beautiful beings we share these worlds with on the soul level. So let all three levels be honored and one spirituality is complete and there's no imbalance. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, you know, there's that old saying, knowledge is different in different states of consciousness. And, uh, you know, although it might be argued that ultimately there is, you know, a, a state or a level which is fundamentally real and that these yeah. and that other things are partial reflections or not as yeah. you know essentially real nonetheless they they do have their own intrinsic every level has its own intrinsic sort of level of value and significance and has to be honored at its own level and you know another key point is that you know you can't mix levels you can't apply the you know understanding of one level of consciousness to the understanding of another you can't Kill the tiger of the dream state with the gun of the waking state, you know. Well uh, said, well said, Rick. I didn't make it up, but. <laughs> oh, okay. Nice borrowing, then. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wisdom. It's coming from all directions. Right. It's all mouths. Yeah. All pens. Yeah. Well, speaking of, um, you know, different levels of reality, um, sure. here, here okay. in Iowa, there's, there's a, the reality of dogs needing a walk at this point. Hey, wonderful. Wonderful. So, uh, you, you're who's great. walking who, Rick? Who's walking who? Yeah, good who? question. <laughs> oh, well, actually, even on the evident level, it's them walking us. Um, yeah. But um, it's really delightful to talk to you, Tim. And um, we'll have to do this again because I'm sure we could easily fill up another two hours like this with. Uh, Certainly. <laughs> anytime, Rick. Anytime. And if you're uh, anyone who viewed this program has questions or anything uh, for a subsequent kind of. Uh, program or uh, I hate to say you write email. I already get flooded with email from aspirants all over the world. Uh, uh, and uh, But I'm happy, you know, really burning questions, not just frivolous questions or ones off the top of the head. Let the questioning or inquiry process go real deep and then whatever kind of real earnest questions one has, uh, if they still haven't been resolved by the light of one's own wisdom, truth, one's own divinity, uh, feel free to email me. My email address is at my website, the enlightened 
www.spirituality.org website. And I'll be uh, linking to that website from batgap.com. Okay. And uh, and you know you could actually, if you wanted to, you could set up a, mm. a you could set up a video song or an audio song like this that went all over the world that you could actually do once a week, and and people could ask questions and you could talk to them and all. I can I can kind of refer you to some people who would help you figure out how to do that technically if it's something you wanted to do. But sure. No, actually, I've had satsang members here in Santa Barbara wanting to do that. Yeah. Uh, I had such a nice time just with the dear friends here, and uh, the thought of, uh, you know, you don't need to see this old mug. It's getting older <laughs> by the second. Uh, your own truth is what's most important, and I've put up so much stuff at the website. If someone were to go through even just a fourth of that and not awaken to their own truth, I'd be surprised uh, because our own truth is so magnificent, it's so available. What we are is is the divine. Open awareness playing beautifully as this poignant human being. And on that note, Rick, I'll wish you namaste. Namaste Jai to you. Jai Guru. Jai Ma. Be well. Thanks, Tim. And this is a great talk. Everyone viewing, uh, just love to all. We are each other, and finally there's just one of us playing as everyone. So everyone you meet, it's not hey you, it's hi I. Hmm. It's one of us here. Enjoy thyself. Very good. Thanks, Tim. Sure.